So before we officially get started, just a, a little bit of housekeeping for folks who might be watching this on YouTube. Um, we're recording this on 20 February 2021, and our next session will be on 20 March 2021 because I need a vacation. Uh, so if, you, if you're watching this on YouTube uh, prior to then, you can sign up for the newsletter at whichkind.com, W-I-T-C-H-K-I-N-D.com, and that's how I'm, I'm communicating. So I haven't sent out the invites and the, the Zoom link for the March sessions yet, but those will all go into that newsletter, uh, and that will come out sometime the first week of March. I need to set up the schedule on that. Um, also, before we officially get started, I wanted to, to brag a little. Um, since we spoke last, I, uh, I just got an email from the literary agent that I've been going back and forth with a little bit. Um, she had found me through Kirkus Reviews, uh, which is a, a very, very long running book review publication. Um, the Daniel Scratch book, uh, my first witch kind story got a starred review from Kirkus, which I was very happy about. And she, she tracked me down and she is going to be uh, representing the book. Um, it is currently self-published, but she is going to connect, be connecting me with um, a story editor to do some, some structural review on the book and take it to some big publishing houses and try and sell it. Um, she is related to the screenwriter for all but one of the Harry Potter movies. So I am, I am beyond excited about that. Congrats. Congratulations. My, my little hobby. Um, I will quit my job if I get a movie deal, just so that we're all, we're all 100% clear. All right. So I am going to uh, enable the waiting room again so that people aren't popping in randomly, but Carlton, you can let them in as they, as they come. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's get started. Um, this session is going to be about my, my outlining and writing process. Uh, this is really at the core of my process. So this presumes you, you know what you want to write about. One of the things we're going to do, uh, I'm going to walk through this both from a technical perspective and from a fiction perspective, because I, I kind of want you to see how they're not that different. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, in one case, you're trying to teach something and in the other, you're just telling a story, but they kind of come down to the same thing, at least for me. So as I, as I walk through some of this preamble stuff, I'd like you all to be thinking of some technical topic, um, because I'm going to just I'm going to try and outline it live, at least to a certain point. So you can you can kind of see the process, because uh, it really is a process. It's not just a matter of sitting down and, and, and writing the thing. Um, so be thinking of, of a topic that we can do in a, a few minutes. Uh, someone was kind enough to send some, some tee up questions. So I'm gonna go through some of those. And one of them is, do you write any initial content or intros to get the sound or flow right for your first chapters? Uh, and I don't. I might should have at one point, um, Right now, I'm comfortable enough with my writing style that I can usually dive in once I have an outline. Like the outline for me is a thousand percent crucial. Uh, I, I have to have a detailed outline or I tend to not write very well. Um, so I, I, I don't tend to write a couple. Or if you're new at it, um, you know, I, I don't know that maybe I would write initial content or intros to get the sound or flow right. I think I would focus on shorter form writing. You know, do some blog posts, do some things that are short, even if you don't share them with other people, until you start to feel your voice, like it starts to come to you, it feels natural to you, you can let your spouse or your sibling or someone else read it and they're like, yeah, no, this makes sense to me, it reads well, I understand it. Practicing for sure, you want to find your voice before you dive in, especially to a long form piece. Um, the worst, and I, I know for a fact I've done this when I, I got started, the worst is to kind of start with one voice and then start to get comfortable halfway through the book and your voice changes because you start writing and you get more comfortable. And so you start writing more like yourself and it's really apparent as a reader when that happens. So you, you do want to find your voice before you engage in a long form piece. But these days with blogs and, you know, all kinds of articles and stuff you can write, um, that's not hard to do. I will say writing short form makes you a better writer. So the first books I wrote were invariably 800 page, 700 page tomes. I mean, you guys know what tech books looked like back in the day, right? These, they sold them by the pound. They were so huge. And I got, I, I'm trying to, I think the first regular magazine column I got was with MP, MCP magazine, Microsoft Certified Professional Magazine back in the day. 
and it was an 800 word column. So that's, that's about right for one magazine page. And I remember uh, Keith Ward, the editor at the time said to me, you will either become a far better writer this way, or you will stop doing articles. You will hate it because you really have to pick every word. And after I had been writing for, you know, two or three years, these columns and, and, and kind of really refined and, and no longer went off on tangents, but just really stayed very concise and focused. I couldn't write the seven, 800 page books anymore. Um, that's one of the reasons that my earlier PowerShell books were only, only 300 pages, 350 pages, because I, I couldn't, I couldn't bloviate anymore. I, I couldn't go off script. I was so used to writing concisely to the point that when I finally partnered with Greg Shields to start a company, um, we called it concentrated technology for a reason. And it's because both of us wrote in that very concise, straight to the point, no tangents, really focused, and it makes for better writing. It really, really does. So focus on writing, put, put, a, put a limit on yourself. You know, I want to teach X and I'm only going to give myself a thousand words in a blog article and count that. Uh, but, you know, most word processors can do a word count these days. It's not that big a deal and force yourself because what you will learn is you can only teach so much and you learn to really focus and you learn to triage. You're like, nope, if I want to get from point A to point B, this is all I can cover. I can't go off on this tangent, can't go off in that direction. So that is part of where outlining comes in. Outlining can make that process a little easier. Uh, what tips do you have if your writing doesn't seem to flow correctly later on? And does that process change when you're writing with a technical focus, conversations with the reader, or telling a story? The process doesn't change, and the process is this. I, I get into the piece. I realize that it's not like I didn't get my outline right. It's not flowing the way I wanted to. I throw a fit. I have a, a, a tantrum. Um, I shove the entire project into a folder and forget about it for a couple of days. Uh, I get very angry and grumpy about it. Everyone in my life knows it. Uh, and then I often will just come back and nuke it and start over. Um, I write quick, so that's not as devastating, but I have never been able to fix my writing. I have had to start over. I've had to do this on more than one project. And the, the end result was way better for it, but it, it meant nuking that. Like sometimes I, I, again, if I don't get the outline right, this soft skills book that I just finished for Manning is a perfect example. Uh, I did not have the outline right. The outline was a bunch of chunks of things and they didn't flow and they didn't connect to one another. And as the editor got into it and started asking questions about how does this information connect? How does it flow? I, I started to get really frustrated with her, um, really, really angry at like, why do you have to beat up on this? And then I realized, well, she's beating up on it because it's not right. Okay, how do I fix that? And you start, you start going in and moving paragraphs around. And now, like now you've made it worse. So I nuked it. Uh, I literally took a, an almost completed 600 page book and nuked it. And some of that writing got reused later, but now it's a 350 page book and it's much tighter. It's much more concise. It's much more meaningful. It's got a much better flow. It's going to be a better book because of that. Um, it is no fun, but you have to, like, you have to know when to quit and that this is, this can't be saved. You know, it was a good process. I, I, I worked through a lot of issues in my head as part of this. I think if I do it again, I'll do a better job. If you go back and look at some of the early PowerShell books I wrote, like the first, the first PowerShell TFMs. So we did the first one and we did a second edition and then we did a new book for version two. Um, you will see that process. You will absolutely see just in the table of contents how writing the first one made me realize what didn't work about the first one and it changed for the second one. Um, those, those outlines, those table of contents are really clear that, that that's what was going on. Um, okay, so who's, who's got a fun tech topic that I could outline? Just unmute and say, say words, not PowerShell. I've done that. I can wait all day. How about uh, infrastructure as code and getting people in that mindset? Sure. Yeah. Infrastructure as code. It's a little random. Why not? Uh, okay. Where's my word processor? 
Um, I do not use fancy tools. Um, one of the first things I'll do is just start jotting down ideas. Now, I've seen some authors use mind map tools for this, and that's fine. Um, I, those for me just get in the way. It's like, first I have to figure out how to learn this tool and I have to follow its rules and I don't like that. So I, I tend to just do big mishmats of, of, of notes. So, you know, I mean, first of all, I've got to go, what is it? Um, infrastructure as code, infrastructure from code, Joe. As is the wrong conjunction there. Um, you know what else? So, like, what does it, what does it look like? Like, I want someone to see uh, what what this physically is. I want someone to see the end result. So maybe that's a good way to put that end result. Um, what problem is being solved? I want people to understand that. What are some of the tools? Uh, What's, you know, maybe let's walk through an example, um, a full on simple example. These, none of these are in order. And this, this is an important part of the process for me is, is just letting it all, letting it all come out. Uh, I will do the same thing for fiction books. A lot of times I'll have scenes in mind, like, like, I think this would be a really enjoyable bit to do. And so I'll write a couple sentences about what I think that is. And I, I will later, I'll figure out how that works into the sequence. And for me, a lot of times the, the stories are, are a sequence of bits and a narrative that gets from one bit to the next bit, to the next bit, to the next bit. So I kind of, I kind of like figure out what the scenes are, and then I try to put them in order and then I try to thread them together. So this is real similar for, for, for tech. Uh, so a full and simple example of, of something, um, you know, maybe, maybe cover where are the edges, what can't you do? Um, uh, maybe, you know, also, how does this look like on-prem versus cloud? Because that, that can be a little different. Uh, so, you know, presuming these are some of the things I want to cover. Now I, you know, once I, once I kind of get this list, like these are all the things I want to get in your head. Right now, I'm kind of assuming that my, my learner's start point, my reader's starting point is um, decent with tech, used to doing it manually. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm pretty, pretty good practitioner, but not a, not a coder. And my end point, and this is really, really, really critical. And this is where you really have to, to make your mission statement. Um, I want to say solid, eh, what's a good word, conversational with infrastructure from code, um, knows what tools there are, knows next steps for digging in deeper, knows where some of the edges are not a practitioner. So this is a, this is a high level book. This is an introductory book. You know, this is maybe a 50 page ebook or something like that. I'm trying to get someone in, but I'm not trying to make them a practitioner. Um, but they do know what stacks are out there. They know how the bits fit together and they've, they've seen it work. So this is someone who, who maybe is ready to go start start saying, okay, for my environment, I'm going to go start figuring out what tools to put together. And I'm going to learn how to use those tools. I'm not going to try and cover the whole ocean here. So that's my starting point, my ending point. And I, and, and those bracket my outline and the outline needs to be a pretty, pretty smooth path from one place to the other. So, you know, just in writing that, um, okay, if I've got, what are some of the tools? What's the process flow look like? I, I wanted you to, to understand that. So let's see, I'm probably going to start with, you know, the first chapter is what problem is being solved. Um, for me, there's almost, I, I want people to feel the problem. I really want to explain that problem and, and make them relate to the problem. Uh, so we've got that. I'll actually show you what I do here. 
Got my little check mark emoji. And I am going to copy him to the clipboard so I can easily check off things as I get to it. So what problem is being solved? Um, and and I, I, I often start that what problem is being solved just by stating the problem, right? You'll notice I haven't even explained what, I haven't even talked about infrastructure from code or infrastructure as code at this point. I'm just, what problem is being solved? What, like, here's the world we're in. So the next bit is where I'll kind of intro the concept of infrastructure from code, talk about what it is. So I'm pitching this as the solution to the problem. And the idea here, what does it look like? No, we haven't got there yet. So I'll, I'll cover this terminology thing maybe in that section. So the idea here is to get to something called with them. What's in it for me? And this is the learner. What's in it for the learner? What are they going to get out of it? So in these first two chapters, and maybe, I don't know, maybe it's one chapter, I haven't figured that out yet. But in these first two bits, I need to make them see the problem, relate to the problem. Like I need to describe the problem in a way they will already relate to. So they will go, oh yeah, I've been there. I feel it. I've, 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 I understand that. It does hurt. How do I fix it? And then immediately pitch this idea of infra infrastructure from code as the solution. So that's the what's in it for me. Um, I, and, and I'm making a promise. So I need to be really clear about what I'm promising up at this point, because I'm promising to get them to this end point. I need to be careful not to oversell it. So, you know, I'm going to have a, in this book, I will teach you, blah, 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 right? That's the what's in it for me. So that's where I'm making my promise. Uh, so the next bit are probably, I want to show them the solution. So this is kind of, it's kind of, if you, if you watch it, a DIY show, like one of the really old ones, like this old house or something like that, Norm would often have built the thing first. And so you can get a vision of what he's building to. And then he rolls all the way back and starts building another one. So you know what the end state is. You know where you're driving. You can buy into that end state. If you're like, no, I don't need a writing desk, you can change the channel and watch something else. But you, you know where you're going and you can see it. And, and you buy off on the fact that this is meaningful to you. So I'm going to show that, that end result. Uh, and now I probably am going to, probably going to talk about what the process flow is. So how do we, how do we get there? And then I'm going to get into what are some of the tools. So now that I know how we get there, this is the, this is the specific, like, here's the road, here's the road you're on a journey and here's the wheels in the car and everything else. Here's the tools. Uh, we'll probably go from there to a full on simple example. So that's taken care of because now I've, I, I can kind of show you some of those tools in motion. And now maybe I'm going to talk about the difference between on-prem and cloud. And then where are the edges? So that now by the time I get to the end of the book, someone should have a solid conversational knowledge. They should know what tools there are. They should know what the next steps are. Um, they should know where some of the edges are. They're not ready to be a practitioner, but they're probably ready to take the next step toward being a practitioner. And that's another thing that's important when outlining is, is really understanding your mission and that this might be the first thing someone reads on the topic, but it won't be the last. You can't, you can't serve the entire ocean to them all at once. You, you, there are going to be next steps. What you need to do is make it clear about what those next steps are. So I might finish this with And I can have some clear action items and guidance on what's next for you. So if that's my high level, what I call my gross outline, uh, now I need to start breaking it down a little bit and thinking about what I'm going to talk about. Um, so what problem is being solved? Get into how we used to do things. Um, talk about how that doesn't scale past a certain point. Um, bring up maintenance. 
not just about the build, it's about the ongoing care and feeding. Uh, bring up a story, tell a story that an admin who starts small and starts to fail as things scale up. So I'm, I'm really trying to pitch the problem here. And I want to talk, I want to bring a sequence along. I want someone to be able to see themselves. Here's how we used to do things. Um, and, and here's why that doesn't work. And you know what? It's not just, it's not just deploying things, which is how we often think about it. You know, it's easy to deploy a server. It's about maintaining that thing over time. It's about keeping it in, oh, in compliance, right? So I, I, even as I talk through this with myself, um, compliance, keeping things in a known state. Oh, and, and you know what else? Uh, it's rolling back changes when they fail. So really start to dig into the details of why the, the old manual way of doing things creates problems and pain and, 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 and get that really driven through. Now, look, we're not talking about 60 pages on this. I'm not going to go on about it forever, but I want to bring these things up. I want to really, really clearly make my case because these issues are things I need to make sure I'm helping solve. If this is the pain, then by the end of the book, I need to have checked off every single one of these to explain how my supposed solution helps solve for those. Um, okay, so if that's, if that's it, um, intro the concept. Okay, here's the concept, terminology, what's the broad idea, how this helps with deployment, patching and maintenance, how it helps with compliance, how it helps with rolling back changes, how it helps with scale, and tell a putative story that talks about an admin who's in this space and he's happy, he likes it, it's going well, he, he doesn't work hard, um, he, you know, he's like Scotty, he tells everyone it'll take eight hours when it really only takes eight seconds. And so then we're going to dive into the, what am I going to teach you? Well, I'm going to teach you what this looks like. Uh, I'm going to teach you what the basic processes are. Talk about some example tools. Talk about where you're going to go next. And you know, in some here, I'm going to show you show you a simple working example. Um, so that's the what's in it for me. I'm actually going to teach you a little bit more than that. I'm going to teach you like the differences between on-prem and cloud, but I'm not going to get in that. I, I, in this just brief bit, I really just want to, to make some firm promises that lead to the solution. I'm going to teach you a little bit more than that. You're going to learn some of the caveats and everything else, but I, 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 want, to, I want this part to be a compelling sales pitch. So I don't want to make it over complete. Um, you have a really good story about an overcomplete sales pitch. We uh, lived in an RV for two years, full time. Uh, didn't have a, a permanent base of location. And when we decided to do this, uh, GM had just come out with a new diesel engine. It was an Isuzu engine called the Duramax. And I really wanted it, but it had just come out. So it was really, really hard to get. So we wound up buying a gas Chevy Silverado 3500. This is one of the big ones with the dual rear wheels, because this was a fifth wheel RV. And it was fine, but it lacked some of the power of a diesel engine. You get into Texas hill country when it's just up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. You can hear the engine going. Ugh. And honestly, it was a pain in the ass to gas up. I mean, think about Think about a, a gas station in your neighborhood where in order to line yourself up with the pump, you're pointing at or directly away from the little convenience store building. Now do that with a 40 foot monster fifth wheel dragging behind you. So we would often find ourselves on the side of the parking lot, having to unhitch, fuel up, rehitch and drive away. I said, I really want to look for one of these diesel engines because then we can go to the big boy semi truck drive through like they're all drive throughs, right? 
So we started looking and we were in Albuquerque and we found the GM, it was the GMC version. So the GMC is the Sierra, the Chevy's, the, the Silverado. They're basically the same. The GMs are a little nicer. They put some more creature comforts into them. Um, so we found one, we found one that had the Duramax engine and it was fairly late at night. We were, we were actually on our way back from dinner and we saw this dealership and saw the truck sitting out there and we're like, oh, 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 oh. So we pulled in and we walked up and I said, you know, this is the Duramax. He says, yeah, I'm like, does it have this package in this package? Yeah, yeah, it's got all that. It's fantastic. Uh, you know what? Let's, let's run the numbers. Like, this is what we have. This is what I want. What's like, what's it going to cost in between? And the, the sales guy, I kid you not, starts selling me the truck and I'm standing there. Yeah, but I bought it already. Like I want it. You're, you're done. You win. Congratulations. And he keeps talking. So I leave Chris out with the salesperson. I walk in and you know, they've got the the sales manager up in the little tower. He says, Hey, can I help you? I'm like, I want to buy that truck. He says, well, yeah, that's our sales. I'm like, he won't shut up. Like, can you just, can you actually just sell it to me? And he laughs. He's like, okay. Well, so that's the point here is when you get into this, what's in it for me, sell it. Don't, don't keep selling it. Like triage this bit. What is really going to matter to the reader to get them invested in this scenario but you don't need to get into the fact that it's got air conditioning and tinted windows. Like you don't, they'll learn that eventually, or you can assume they already know it. This is the sales pitch. So keep it tight. Uh, okay. So moving on, um, I'm not going to, I probably won't go much further in, into a bunch of this. So I'm going to tell a little story. I, I want to create a vision for someone. I want them to see what this looks like. And so I want to talk about a little scenario. I want to show the actual code. Like I, I want to show the writing desk from Norm Abrams. I want someone to see that this is a real thing and talk about some places where this exists in the real world. Uh, and, and probably talk a little bit about Flipping your mind on process, maybe, because in the in, in the real world of, of building servers, we tend to build them and then and then we just try to maintain them. But the idea here is And this is where I'll get into the pets versus cows. And really, this is, this is the beginning of the education. This is where I want to start convincing the person to make the changes in their head that they're going to need to make. Because people are going to come in with a bunch of preconceptions about, about how things work in the world. And you've got to be able to say, yeah, they did, but they don't anymore. Like, you know, I, I don't want you to think about building a server and, and, and keeping it and loving it and applying patches. I'm like, no, blow it away and build a new one that already has the patches. Like, that's what we're going to do. We're going to build a brand new up-to-date server from scratch every single time. And you're thinking, oh my God, that's horrible. I've got a thousand of them. I'll, I'll be shuffling DVDs all, you know, the rest of my, that's the point of this. Like, this is the capability to not have to do that anymore. So as I go through this process, um, I'm probably going to find that there are some things that are in the wrong order. And, and this feels like one. This, this whole pets versus cows, um, I really feel maybe belongs, belongs up here someplace. Stop that. I want to get that concept out of the way because that's a good analogy that I can start hinging on and I can bring it up a lot more. And I, I find that when you're trying to change someone's mind about something, a really, and so this is in, in one of my books, um, 
uh, the nine principles of immediately effective instruction, like go big with these leading analogies, right? Like really, really get out there and, and be a little bold and, and a little, a little edgy, you know, like, Hey, what does the farmer do uh, when his, his favorite dog gets sick? Well, he, he takes it to the vet. He spends a couple thousand dollars on it. He, you know, he loves that dog. That, that dog is his companion. He, he, he loves it more than his wife. Maybe what's he do when one of his cows gets sick? They probably kills it. Lots more cows, plenty of cows. Don't care about the cows. Um, what's the dog's name? All oh, the dog's name is Rover. You know, he was born five, six years ago. What's the cow's name? Uh, seven. I don't know. And, and use that to start setting up your, your, your brain shift for people uh, in the PowerShell world. You know, the, the biggest issue that I was trying to get people past initially was like, you need to do this. This is important to you. This, this is, this is going to be a big thing in your career. And so it was learn PowerShell or learn to say, would you like fries with that? Um, I would see people start to try and, and reuse their past knowledge in PowerShell. Um, they were used to using the echo command in batch files, or they were used to using something like wscript.echo and vbscript. So when they wanted screen output, they would use write host. And as soon as I saw them do that, I'm like, you know, I mean, that's fine, but why they're doing it is not fine. They're thinking they're doing thing A, but in reality, they're doing thing B, and that is going to create a lot of confusion. The fact that they're doing that means they don't understand this yet. So I would say, okay, everybody, now I want you to write this down in your book. Um, every time you use write host, I would write down every time you use write host, God kills a puppy. And that's a sudden big thing, right? Everyone pays it to like, oh, I'm like, yeah, but he really does. It's not a joke. All the dead puppies are your fault. And here's why. And now, now they're listening. Now I can talk about the why. So use those big statements and, and hinge them. Keep them in your thread the whole way. Like once you create that strong image to center on, use it, center on it. Like if it's capturing people's attention, then, then, then go for it. It doesn't always work out. A lot, of, a lot of times those big statements for me come in a very ad hoc moment at conference sessions or in a class. Cause I see a problem and my brain is just like, okay, we've got to stop this. And one of them, uh, this was the bad one. And, and, I, and I just want to apologize up front for it because it is bad. Uh, even Jason Helmick was in the audience right up front. And as soon as I said it, I'm like, Ooh, that's going to land badly. And I, his eyes were like, Oh my God, I can't believe you said that. And it was, we were talking about PowerShell remoting. And I said, now you guys have tried to get WMI and distributed calm through firewalls before, right? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, that's really, I'm like, it's really hard. It's like, it's like, it's like pushing a baby through cheesecloth, right? It's ugly and nobody wants to do that. And they're like, oh, oh, I'm like, well, yeah, okay. It was maybe a little too big of a big statement, but those big statements can be something that you can hinge on. They, they attract attention. Um, so once I get my outline, um, I want to shift into what the writing process looks like. On one, one question before you switch yeah. too much on that. So if we, if we come up with something that we want to kind of be one of those underlying points, as, as we get it maybe to the point that it's polished, that we think, ooh, this is something that's actually a good drop in, is, is it good to go back in and yeah. add that into the outline? Oh, absolutely. Because okay. you want to remind yourself to do it. Be because, all right, so the, this is a little OCD, but I legit have to go through here and put white space in to break these things up. And I really recommend you do the same. Um, so I'm just hitting shift enter to create a, a hard return. When you write and, and when you organize yourself, do not underestimate the value of a little bit of white space. Uh, it really helps the human brain. It, it's why this current love affair with dark UI themes is actually kind of BS. Um, I know it looks sexy, but that's like, we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of years of human brain behind us and our brains center on emptiness and we perceive white as empty. Um, we, we don't perceive darker colors as emptiness. We, we see them as colors. Uh, there's a, there, there's actually a lot of cognitive science behind this. If you look at the development of different human languages over time, uh, most human languages do not start with words for colors. 
And when a language gains a word for color, uh, it is always red, which makes a lot of sense because the things that are dangerous to us in the world tend to be red. Um, you know, blood is red and, and you shouldn't see blood. Blood needs to stay on the inside. Uh, poisonous things tend to be red, berries and so forth. Uh, if there's a second color word, it's always blue. If there's a third one, it's always green because these are things in our environment. We don't, one of the last words we develop is for white or clear. Interestingly, one of the last numeric words we develop is zero because the concept of nothing is so deep in our brains that it's difficult for us to even express it with a word for a long, long time. So white space is really critical to how your brain works and you should use it. Um, you know, go through and put some, some, see, it creates a nice visual block. I know where things start and stop this way. So here's my writing process. Once I've done this, and a lot of times I'll ask for a lot of people's feedback. Um, I, the, you know, the outline for the first PowerShell month of lunches book was a month of, of working, not full time, obviously, but it was a, it was a solid month of some solid work. So then it comes time to write. And I have a, a very standard process and it really works and it takes time for it to work. It will not work for you instantaneously. But if you force yourself to follow this process, your brain will catch on. It will figure out what you're doing and it will, it will do it. Before I go to bed, I sit down for no more than 20 or 30 minutes and I read this just the bit that I'm going to write the next day. If I know I'm not going to write the next day, I don't do this. If I've scheduled time to write, and I, I, I rarely try to write more than a chapter a day. I can, but it's extremely, extremely rare. I read this. I think about it. I might, I might add some more notes on here. That might be a good story to add here. Um, maintenance, you know, it's not about the build. Okay, I'm gonna talk about compliance. So this is, this is drift. People installing software, um, you know, stuff not getting removed, losing track of what we actually need, stuff like this. Writing this down is important because you're, you're, the human brain learns better the more senses are involved in an experience. Thinking about something is one thing. Quite honestly, typing isn't as good as physically writing. Physically writing something on a sheet of paper is more tactile. Um, if you're a good touch typist, Typing isn't an experience. It's not a sensation. That's the point of it, right? Is, is you've removed a step between your brain and the page. But in this case, we actually want your brain to be really focused on what you're doing. So um, the outline for most of my books is on paper at some point. Uh, I, I write them down. And so I'm, I'm going through this and like, okay, I, I feel I've made some notes. I, I know what I'm going to be writing about tomorrow. Kind of got some ideas for stories and maybe I'll make some notes about those. And then I go to bed. And then I wake up the next morning and I write. And if you look at this outline, I'm really only writing a paragraph or two for each of the lowest level things. And because I read this and because I've done this enough and my brain knows what I'm up to, I go to bed, I wake up and it's all, it's sorted. It's in my head. I've got my stories. I've got my analogies. I know what I'm going to write. I just need to sit down and write it. I do not worry too much about the language, the spelling. I, I shut off the spell check and the grammar check because the little squiggly underlines distract me. And I'm compulsive enough that I want to go fix them right away. I mean, you guys have seen, I, I've been trying to fix my, my type. I can't stop myself, but I need to, when I'm, if I'm going to get in the groove, I need to just get the the notions out. I need to get the words out. They don't need to be spelled right. Someone else can fix that. The spell checker can fix that. I need to put as few things in the way and I need everyone to leave me the hell alone. And everyone in my family knows when I'm having a writing day and they know to stay away. 
Chris will sneak in with a coffee. He'll sneak in with some, some lunch meat roll-ups so I don't die. And he sneaks right the hell out. And we keep the door closed. So it minimizes my typing because I, I, I don't know if you guys can hear me typing, but I am, I am a pretty hideous typer. Um, it, it's just leave me in my groove. If someone interrupts me, it is half an hour to get back in that groove. And so I make sure there's a lot of incentives to not interrupt me. I shut things off. There's, there, my phone's not in the room. There's no instant messages. There's no Slack. There's no, there's no email because as soon as something pops up, my brain goes, wouldn't that be more fun? Like, this is hard. This is work. Wouldn't that be more fun? Just a little, just for a second, just for just check Facebook. But no, shut it all off. Let your brain stay in the groove. And once you teach it to do that, you will find yourself getting better and better. It took me, and I'm I, I, like, I want you to understand, you need to commit to this method. It took me two or three books before this started to really work, like not two or three chapters. You have to force yourself. It's like going to the gym, right? You're not going to see results for the first six weeks, but you need to keep doing it or you never will see the results. Um, and that is literally, this is how I write fiction too. Uh, in fact, let me switch screens. Scrivener. Uh, I'm going to work on this book later today. And here's my blocking. And I already know I am right. I am here. And I've already, I've already read this. I've thought about what's going to happen. I've thought about what the characters are going to do. I just need to write it down. And I did, I did all that last night as we were sitting watching TV. I was just running. Oh, oh, you know what? Um, the, they're going to be, they're going to be going after somebody who's manufacturing dynamite. They don't call it dynamite. So, I'm, you know, that's, I've already looked up that's glycerin. There's copper and some nitric salt involved. So I've got different names for those things in my more primitive world. Um, and I, I, I know that it's feasible. Like I've done some research on Wikipedia already. So I, like, I know it's feasible for people at this tech level to have discovered this, uh, but it's really dangerous because they haven't figured out how to make it stable yet. So like, I need one of my characters to get injured and this is, they're going to try and steal a sample of it. And they're going to, it's going to blow up and they're going to get seriously injured. And so that's, that's how I'm going to get to that plot point. Like I've, I've got all this. I know all this. I just need, as soon as I'm done with you guys, I'm going to go have waffles and then write it. And it's only going to take me a couple hours. Um, and it'll be like 5,000 words. So that's my, that's the process. And I swear to you, it works if you can stick with it. So let's stop there for a second and, and discuss. Don, I had a question for you. Yeah. So what if you've nailed down your outline and your chapters and you're, you're let's say you're on chapter 10 now and you're, you're writing out the, the chapter. Do you ever get to a point where you think, I wrote something here that's going to break something in chapter three? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I spend enough time on my outlines now that for tech books, that doesn't happen. But uh, I really pissed off my beta readers on this book, by the way, if you guys want to see my writing process. You should, you should email me and ask to get on my beta reader list. Um, so look, here's my book blocking. Now this is a trilogy and I, I, I've, I've got the other books blocked out in less detail. So this is, this is a book that's not fully outlined. I just, I kind of know what's going to have to happen in the story, but I need to get a little bit more detailed, but there comes a point where I'm not going to look for it right now, where he meets a dude and I need to foreshadow some things. Well, that means I need to go back. And so what I did in the, the book one blocking is up at the top here, I put a note while well, we're add a bit. This was a, this was a terrible place to do this because I, I was already a couple chapters in for I'm like, Oh, you know, it'd be great is if I could foreshadow meeting him and then I could create this like this uh, uh, Voldemort style, like let, that's literally what I want. I want this like Voldemort style thing going on. If you think about how, how Rowling foreshadowed Voldemort through like Tom Riddle and some of these other characters, right? I want that. So I put this in and I didn't work it into the damn outline. So now I'm, I'm freaking halfway through the book and I'm going back here and, and I keep this here because this is what I'm working on. And then I scroll up to here because this is what I'm working on. Well, I had to reboot my computer for an update. So when I opened it back up again, it was up here. And I'm like, out of it, shit. 
we have a character who's exceptionally weak. We learn that in reality, blah, 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 blah. And he had these tattoos because his family's a bunch of jerks. Oh, crap. Literally on chapter 10, I had to go back and work a new character into chapters one, five, and seven because I needed to, I needed to create that thread. And it's really hard. Like you can't just go in and drop a character in out of nowhere. Like you've got to build a reason for that character to be there. And I had some specifics about it. Like I needed, I needed only the students to be aware of this character. The fa faculty and the staff in this school can't be. So I had to make sure that, you know, as a teacher in, in chapter one, as a teacher is, is being called, you know, calling people out and students are shouting stuff out. Like this character had to be able to interact, but in a way that the faculty's lack of noticing seemed natural. Like they were, they were doing something else or the kid whispered it and no one know, like I had to work that into the story. Uh, so it's painful. It's really hard. It, it inspires me to do better with my outlining because it, I spent a day that could have been productive writing, adding maybe 500 words to the book because I had to, I had to work them in and then I had to go back and read it. And I hate reading my own writing so I had to go back and read it and make sure it still made sense. Um, so it is hard. I, I, I do have those situations, but like, you know, you deal with it. If it's really, really bad, I've been known to trash books. If you look at the outline differences between the first PowerShell month of lunches and the second edition, you'll see where that happened. You'll see where I flipped some things around because the order didn't make sense. And I needed to, to do a thing before I did another thing. And so on the second rewrite of the, and I didn't realize it till the book was published. I was, I was teaching it. I'm like, holy crap, this is totally the wrong order to do this. I should have flipped these. Damn it. So I taught them flipped. And then when we did a second edition of the book, I, I flipped them and, and rewrote the narrative so that they worked flipped. Which is another thing, like, like you can rewrite a book, right? There can be a second edition. You guys, you guys, um, who's, who, I asked this last time, who's read Lord of the Rings? Just Joe, really? Joe's the only human who's read Lord of the Rings. That's a little scary. Um, okay, Joe, you're on the spot. Unmute. Tell me how to spell elf. This isn't a trick question. It's easy. How do you spell yeah. elf? ELF. Okay. Spell the plural. E-L-V-E-S. Okay. Except that in the first round of Tolkien's books, it wasn't. Right? Tolkien, right. Tolkien tweaked and modified those books like six separate times. What we have now is like the, the author's preferred edition. But it's because back in the day, you would ship it off your manuscript off to an editor and they would do stuff to it without consulting you. And then you would get the final printed copy and you're like, wait a minute, when did it become Elf's? and dwarfs, it's dwarves, you idiots. It's not elfin as a language, it's elven. So there were rewrites and, and a new edition was published and like, it's fine. You, it's fine to screw it up and get it wrong and fix it later. So I've got two questions. Um, one, going back to you talking about putting in analogies or even your personal stories in your writing, um, you know, your note about uh, deploying BDCs at, at Bell. I, I know that a lot of those personal stories going into the books or into your writing typically land a lot better, even if people have no context for them, because you know the story better, you're able to put in a lot more of the fine grained details, or you're able to explain the concepts a lot better. Is it... Uh, at what point do you go overboard with the with the analogies or uh, like one of the questions I had sent was was when you're trying to do the storytelling for readers and you're trying to do things like you had mentioned, sticking to cars and mechanics, something that's outside of the tech realm to have what most people have at least a basic concept and understanding for to try and land those points. Do you stick with one and try and, and you know, tell that same story all the way through? like you did with, with the blacksmith and in, in be the master, or do you switch it up so that there are more differing context for people to try and land? Um, I'll often switch it up. So first of all, a lot of those personal stories are lies. Um, they are fiction and they're made up because a real world story lands better with people. 
And so you have to do that, but sometimes I don't always have the direct experience. And so I have to make up a story and that's okay because it, it, it's, it's being done to teach someone something, you know, not, not anything else. Um, I will usually switch it up. If, if you look at some of the analogies that get used in like the month of lunches books, um, they, they change. They, they do shift from one to the other. I try to be very clear about where an analogy falls apart because they all do, right? Anything, if you take it too far, starts to fall apart. And I try to be clear about where that is. Like, you know, so, so like in cars, you've got this and this and this, but here's where it all falls apart because with, with object oriented programming, it's also this and this, and you would never have that in a car, but the analogy gets me to the point I need it to get me to. And then I acknowledge where it falls apart. Um, I, I, I do switch them. Um, the, the, the Timothy, the blacksmith story and be the master was a retroactive construction meaning I had already outlined everything I wanted to get into. And then I created a story that touched each of those. Um, that took a, a long time, actually. Writing that 1600 word introductory chapter probably took a week because I, I, I needed it to do all these things with these fake characters and, and work it into a story. Um, but it, it, it was good to hinge on, right? Like, like for that book, because it was intended to be kind of a motivational self-improvement type thing, you've got 1600 words right up front that create an emotional impact and secretly contain every single message. That, like if you could just read between the lines better, you wouldn't even need to read the book. So that one, that one was kind of an, an exception. Kind of depends on your purpose, right? Be the Master wasn't about teaching, it was about motivating. Um, the PowerShell books are about teaching more than motivating. So you take a different approach to it. And then um, one of the points that you make in, um, in immediately effective instruction is that the repetition is important, but essentially it's only effective when it's the student that's doing that repetition. So when it is something that's say an intro book or you're, you're providing a even falsified real world analogy to get the point across to somebody, how do you help translate that into repetition for the reader when all they're doing is, is just consuming content and not actively working at the command line or things like that? Yeah, that's a place where sticking with the same analogy can, can be helpful because it, it, it brings it back to that. And every time you bring it back to that analogy, the brain links it to the previous mentions. And in that linking, it creates a stronger synaptic network. So that now it becomes a more powerful memory. And the next time I mention that, it becomes a little bit more powerful. And the next time, so you're, you're building a network and then it gets a little bit more powerful each time you refer to it. Um, that's what repetition does, is it, it, it creates, adults are a little resistant to just rote repetition. But, you know, if I'm using a Star Trek analogy, by the end of the book, like you're, you're with me, like Star Trek is, is, is firm in your mind and you're starting to relate things in really well. So crafting that, so that you can use repetition with that um, is an important part of the outlining process. It's like figuring out up front, this is going to be my story thread. So, so we've got like five, six more minutes um, talking about outlining, talking about how that translates into the actual writing. Uh, you, you can probably see that I do not just sit down and start writing most of the time. I really, really, really put a lot of planning um, whether it's a fiction book or a technical book. And, you know, with a fiction book, the idea is I want to tell a story and I need to get the character to a certain place. And I have these scenes I want to put in between and I have to plan how those, those craft together. So, you know, real quick, just to highlight some of that, uh, let me share my screen again. You know, when you get into my blocking for this book, actually, let's, let's take a look at one of these, which is a little... So, you know, in the beginning, he's two years older. He's one of this organization's best field operatives. Uh, he's tired. And so they're giving him an easy mission to get into. He's shepherding a new recruit. So I'm, I've, I've created touchstones. Like these are the things I need to happen at each point. I don't know how I get from each one to the next yet. That'll happen in my next level of blocking. But if these things happen in this order, then I will get to where I need to get to at the end which in this case sets up the third book, which has roughly the same level of blocking done for it. I've even in this one, I've got some points 
that I haven't worked into the story yet, but I need to make. And as I, as I get into this one a little bit more, I'll have to craft those in. So there's a ton of planning that goes into these for me. Now, look, not everyone writes fiction like this. Um, George R.R. R. Martin famously doesn't. He just likes to see where the characters are going to go, which is not working out so well as he tries to wrap up the story, apparently, um, because he didn't plan for it all to get wrapped up, right? Um, I'm a little bit more methodical about it. Some of that probably comes from having written so many technical books, but I, like, I want to know where it's all going to end. Um, if you read the first Witch Kind trilogy, there's a character called Gemma that infuriates Chris to this day. I, I brought her up for a specific purpose, but then I kind of didn't use that purpose. And I kind of forgot about it because I didn't outline that first book really. Um, and even the second one, I was a little hazy on the outlining. So for the third one, I'm like, okay, I got to wrap this up. So I really got into planning. I'm like, okay, this character is going to do that and that and that so that I can kill her and just get rid of her and be done with it. And everyone was pretty satisfied with how that ended. But it just showed me the importance of sitting down and planning this out. Like if you're going to have all these multiple threads, people are going to want them tied up in the end. Um, there, there's one now that Chris is, is, is starting to bug him that I will tie up, but not till real close to the end of the trilogy. And I don't want to spoil the surprise. So he just has to be frustrated with it for now. Um, but I do have it in the outline, right? So, you know, the, the outlining is, is super, super important. Um, we'll do like one or two more questions, but I want to let you know. So the next session will be uh, March 20th. So a month from today after my vacation. Um, I will, you will, uh, first week of March, the newsletter will go out. It will have all the March links. Um, I, I've, I've got two scheduled, so it'll be, the, the last two Saturdays in March. Um, and then we'll do, so that'll be session three and four, and then we'll do uh, a couple in April. Um, the next one is going to be about using Scrivener. Um, just from my own hard, hard one, hard one. Oh my God. So difficult of a tool to use, but so effective once you start. Um, session four will be about the business of writing. So, you know, does this does this include translating your writings into video content, uh, into live teaching? Do you self-publish? Do you go through a publisher? What are some of the options? What are the finances? We'll, 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 like, we'll, get, we'll talk dirty about the numbers. Um, session five will be about storytelling. And so, Joe, that'll be, that'll be really some of what you're asking, too, is, is, is how do you craft a story that weaves uh, and, and that, that brings someone through an entire work? And then our last one. Uh, session six will be a little pop cognitive science. We're going to talk about how people learn and how they enjoy, like what it is in the brain that creates learning and creates the enjoyment for a fiction story. They're actually the same thing. Um, and it's why storytelling is an effective way of teaching because the brain works in a certain way for, for both story consumption and for learning. Um, so we'll have, and, and I've got some, some great reference books um, around there too. Um, <laughs> thank you, Joe. Yeah, the GSOT. Um, that's what, so if, if you're in the chat window, oh, you can put that in the main window. I just realized you just sent that to me, Joe, put that in the main window. Um, there's another one of my books that, that is a little snarky. Um, if you're okay with snarky books that are totally going to be dissing whatever state you live in, um, that's a good one to grab on Amazon. That's about the it, it's a travel log essentially about the two years we lived in the RV um, and, and what we ran into and how we got thrown out of California and uh, you know, the bars we found and we had ferrets with us the whole time. Um, so that that's a, a key part of the story. Uh, okay. Like maybe one last question from anybody before we, we call it a weekend. Um, can you share a quick one for you? Can I share the text of the tech book outline? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, I just wanted to find out when you're doing a blog post, it's not like a how to. Do you do an outline for that as well? Or you just sometimes start writing it? Yeah, the better ones. You, it, I bet if you go read a bunch of my stuff, you can tell where I did and where I didn't. Um, and one clue is that where I, where I did outline it, I use headings. And when I, when I don't have headings, um, you'll notice that I tend to run on a bit it'll get a little rambly. Like, like you could go read some of the ones I've been writing about the constitutional amendments, which I do not outline up front. 
And you can kind of see how the story goes a little, a little hinky on the sides sometimes because I just write those for fun. Um, but you can definitely see the ones that I've, I've done outlined because they almost all have headings. Um, I will, I will take this, this outline that I did for the, the fake tech book and I will stick it in a Google doc or something, and I'll link to it in the email newsletter, um, for next time, which I, I need to get put together today. Thanks for doing this, Don. Cool. Thanks for showing up. I will, uh, I will see you all in a couple of weeks or a month, a month, really. A great vacation. What's that? A great vacation. Yeah. Oh, well, I'd better. <laughs> <laughs> I really need it. <laughs> Have a good weekend, guys. Rough with no Disney right now, huh? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, cool. Take it easy, Don. Bye. Bye, Dale.